There you go. Good morning. Yeah. We uh, want to welcome, uh, I'm no, I know you don't know these people, they're involved in ministry and now, uh, Ben and Hannah have been doing, uh, I always say it wrong, Ratio Christi. Ratio Christi. Yeah, it's good. I got a really difficult question for him for later, but. <laughs> uh, but uh, we are wanting to give them this time this morning for Sunday school and uh, to share what they're doing and how they're doing it. And um, we also want to give you time for some questions. And so we want to get started as soon as possible, so we want to welcome them and say we're glad you're involved and glad you're here. Hey, Emma. Check, Emma, check. Can you put the thing on the back? Emma, can you put the thing so we can see it? Oh, yeah. On the back? Yeah, Sorry. while she's working on that. Oh. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's so great to see you guys interested in this. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through this. Uh, we have a presentation here. We'll go through it. And um, we'll have some questions later as well. So time for questions. So if you, if you have some questions, we'll have some designated time later on. Um, but we're going to go through this uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, wish we had three hours. We do not. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of good stuff here. We're just going to specifically try and focus in on our Utah trip, but we'll give you a little bit of background here on who we are, what we're doing. Um, so we'll just go ahead and jump right in. So right now, Hannah and I are living in Manhattan, and we're working in Manhattan. And while we're in Manhattan, we're also uh, chapter directors, officially staff for an organization and a club at Kansas State University. So we are the chapter directors for our Ratio Christi um, club up at K-State. And so basically what Ratio Christi is, it's an organization that focuses on apologetics and evangelism on the college campuses. So we go into a college campus, start a club, and we focus on equipping believers, training them with good apologetics, uh, reasons to believe, knowing why you believe what you believe, and also, how to articulate those views to other people who may not share your perspective. And so we focus on apologetics and evangelism specifically. And we also come alongside some other, you know, whatever other ministries are at K-State to help them and equip their believers as well. And so um, those are a couple things that we do at, at Kansas State. Um, and also, I want to mention real quick while we're on this slide... Um, a part of that ministry is we, and this has been our season, uh, we've been trying to reach out to the LDS community, and that's Latter-day Saints. So that's, for, for another term, it'd be the Mormons, right? Uh, but now they prefer the term Latter-day Saints, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so one of the things that uh, we do is we try and reach out to the local LDS, just among other groups, at, in Manhattan. And... We actually set up a meeting with some of our officers are just as excited and fervent to talk to the LDS as we are. And so we had a meeting with a couple LDS missionaries. Do you, you want to? Yeah, and we started talking like, oh, like, where are you from? Where have you been? Because a lot of times the missionaries will move from different places in Kansas. And so we're kind of just getting their background. And then we're like, oh, yeah, we're from like a town far away. And they're like, oh, like, what's it called? I'm like, oh, Inman. And they're like, we've been to Inman, and I was like, you guys have been to Inman, Kansas? I'm like, we grew up there. And they were saying that they just, like, walked down, like, Maple Street, trying to, like, go door knocking, and I was like, my parents live on Maple Street. So <laughs> <laughs> it was cool to be like, you, they're, like, literally in your backyard. Mm -hmm. So when they knock on your door, you should answer your door. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were the nicest people, so we talked to them for about two or three hours up there in Manhattan, and... And it was incredible because I noticed when I first started meeting with them, I've never met with them before, and I felt all this apprehension. It's, I mean, it's almost as if, oh, those are the Mormons, but I didn't recognize that they're people too. And as we just started talking about whatever it was, you know, about the weather and just getting to know each other, how long have you been in Manhattan, Kansas? It was incredible just to, to build relationships. Next thing we knew, we were 
we're going out to do outreach with them, playing volleyball and doing all of these other, doing these other things. So it's incredible to see that their missions are in our own community. So be, be on the lookout because, I mean, these people, I'm telling you, they, they are a part of a system that, that does not cultivate the love of Christ. It is not rooted in the truth of Christ. Which is why I labeled this just Jesus. It's because of what they believe. They believe they have to work their way to salvation. Like, oh, if I make my bed every morning or if I open the door for this older person, then I can, like, earn my way to heaven. And at the end of the week, it's like, you know what? It's sad because you just need Jesus. But, like, oh, we need Jesus and works to get there. Mm -hmm. So altogether, we were in Utah for a week. So we left Friday night, went to Omaha. We had people from Omaha that were also in a part of Ratio Christi. So we teamed up with them. And also with Ratio Christi people in Kansas City, they came over to Omaha. And we had uh, a couple others. One was from Michigan. One was from Georgia. And we had another group from the East Coast, the Carolinas. So we had a big group of, it was about over 20. Yeah, 20. And... We all gathered together, and we made the 18 to 20-hour drive uh, through the mountains going out to, to Salt Lake. So, um, yeah. So on our know. first day, we went to a sacrament service, and usually they have, like, a sermon at the sacrament service, but one of their bishops, I guess, was sick. And so we happened to be there, and they did testimonies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a picture of their ward and so um and they have different buildings in the lds uh tradition they have wards are basically the churches that they'd have typical sacrament service or their, their sunday service and so that's that's what you're seeing here that's their ward so we went in there and they had a couple things that took place during the service they had a baby, like a dedication, a prayer. Which, during the baby dedication, the women are not allowed to come on stage. So it was just the dad and the baby, and the mom had to, like, yeah. stand in the back. Because women have more of a lower role in the LDS church. When it came to that type of um, baby dedication. Mm -hmm. And um, they also, they have communion, which is a little bit different as well. Um, if you want some more of these details on these particular things, come talk to us. But we should also mention, we put up a trifold over in the foyer. So if you just kind of want to learn a little bit more and just see what these people have as, as a belief system, what they, what they believe in, you can go look at some of those, um, some of that literature out there. Um, but also, yeah, there was very minimal scripture, I noticed, in, in the, because what they do is about once a month at a ward, they gather together and they will have their testimonies. So people will get up and they'll walk to the front and they'll say that they, they bear testimony and they'll share something that they've been experiencing in the past week or something that's been on their heart or, or something that they've been thinking about. And, and that was one of the most impactful things, I think, for us because as we were going through those testimonies, um, yeah, there you go. Well, first, here's some songs they sing. Here's Praise to the Man which the man is Joseph Smith. So, yeah, we'll get to the testimonies. Oh. We, they also had worship that they had. And, and it was really interesting because we were just kind of flipping through. They have a lot of hymns that we would be familiar with. But then they also add in a bunch of other hymns that we have never seen before. And that first one, um, Praise to the Man, uh, you, I'm not sure if you can read that, but it's talking about Joseph Smith as a martyr, and uh, that is the story of Joseph Smith. He did some things, and people were upset with him, and he wound up in prison, and a mob went to that prison, and they shot him there. And so he is hailed as a martyr in the LDS tradition, and you can see that uh, that's about as provocative and heartbreaking a title that I can see in that sense, right? Because they are having this praise directed towards Joseph Smith rather than the person of Christ. And so, go ahead. To the, uh, another thing, oh. yeah, go to the testimony one if you could. Another one was a testimony, and this is, this is huge. This is um, probably the biggest thing for each personal LDS person, and, and for us as well. There's some parallels there. Um, but you can see how they take it, I think, to a, a different degree that's, um, that's a little bit problematic in that their sole, their sole basis for everything they believe 
is they, they pray to see if the Book of Mormon is true. I mean, that's what the Book of Mormon, one of their scriptures says. And it's a little bit heartbreaking because it's all on a feeling, but as believers, we get to experience the blessings of a relationship and experiences with the Holy Spirit. But our experience is rooted in truth, in something that is 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 actually founded in truth. Yeah, and you, studying, yeah. Um, before I went to Utah, I studied a lot of Mormon theology, and it just makes your praise so much more because you're like, I am worshiping the one true God, and but it breaks your heart because you're like, they're not singing to the one true God, and it's heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. And again, a lot of Joseph Smith focusing on here, but another him just focusing on his moment, and, and uh, we'll get into that yeah. later. Um, and here's some of the testimonies. Quickly, one of the most impactful testimonies was a little boy. He was about uh, seven or eight, or yeah, yeah something like that. Um, um, and he went up, and I, apparently he had spoken like that before. Mm -hmm. But he was, like, stuttering, and you could just tell he was, like, really nervous. I'm like, is this kid going to be actually able to say something or just, like, stand up there? Yeah, and it is nerve-wracking for, yeah. for a kid. But um, one of the most impactful things that he said at the very end of his, of his testimony as he was getting it out, is he said, I know that if we work hard enough, we can all make it to heaven. And it breaks your heart because you know that, and especially with the baby dedication, we just got the picture of this is a generational thing. These are passed down to kids and their kids, and it just it just ripples yeah. on. And it's so hard for them to leave because it's, it's they're so community based. So it's like if they leave the church, they're like excommunicated and like they're giving up their family because they want to follow the true God. And it's there is a very big excommunication culture, meaning if they walk around the walk out of the faith. Um, a lot of people that don't keep up with the LDS faith by their own LDS community and a lot of times their family, they're seen as a quote, people that just can't cut it. They just can't, they just can't cut it. They can't make the, make the cut. And so it breaks your heart that it's, it's, it's based off of that perfectionism that you see in the LDS church. And oh. so you want to talk about that? Yeah, so at, we left like mid-service um, at the sacrament service, and we went to Mosaic Church, and Provo, yeah, Provo, like 99 point yeah. six. Yeah, and this is an, another reason. Yeah, LDS, so like we're like 0.6% yeah. evangelical, and so they're planning churches in Utah, and like just to see the contrast between the sacrament service and this service was night and day. Yeah, and like we got it, we sang like true like gospel songs. We heard the word being preached. We also got to witness a baptism. This woman, you could like tell from her testimony that she was talking, and she was actually a former LDS. So it was really cool to like start off the week of like, this is why we came to Utah, so we can plant these seeds so that eventually they will um, change to our side. Yeah, and that's something that's incredible. Um, about this area of Salt Lake. I mean, it's got such a historic root with the LDS Church, um, but something that is incredible, on paper, there's studies that show that, I mean, as far as the presence of maybe an evangelical, and we only say that because they're familiar with, um, like, a Bible, like a more of a Protestant tradition would be associated with that term, but it's only 0.6%, like, biblical Christian, like, 0.6%. And you talk about an unreached people group. Now, that's on paper. But when we went to Utah, we found out there's a lot of people who have backslidden from the LDS faith. And instead of 97% LDS, I think it's a lot less than that, much less. Um, oh, I was going to say one more thing. Yeah, I, that experience, going to a ward with the LDS community and just experiencing how dead, spiritually dead it was, it was... It just sapped the energy out of you. But then we went to uh, Mosaic Provo and went to this, this biblical church. And people just singing praises. You're like crying because yeah. you're like, this is so much happier than the sacraments. I, I could hardly yeah. bear the transition from the two. Because now we're on one hand, you could see people like that young boy burdened by shackles of, of bondage, of perfectionism, earning it. And then we go to Mosaic Provo and we're and singing, free, we're singing free of indeed. freedom in the gospel of Christ, the true gospel, mm -hmm. and witnessing 
um, that baptism was incredible. In fact, that church is, uh, it's, it's been around for a few years. They started, you know, very small, 10 people. Now they're well over 100, and 20% of that church is young LDS people who have left the faith. And that gal that we went and saw her baptism, I mean, it's her not your family, that they're still LDS, but they came to watch her baptism. They did, yeah. And it's incredible because the LDS um, liturgy doesn't really leave room for that freedom of expression of that freedom um, to the gospel. But when you went to this mosaic and you saw this baptism, every, I mean, we, we had this room on the side and everybody piled into this room. We couldn't even see it. We had to look through a window through the back, hundreds of people gathering around her and she's baptized and everybody's cheering. And it's just, it just shows you that the difference in the freedom of Christ that we can experience. So this is Cody. So it's still the first day. We're trying to figure out, oh, where are you from? Oh, you're from here. This guy's talking and I'm so confused. And then he brings up polygamy and I'm like, Whoa there, pal. Like, where are you from? And he's actually, he is in a polygamist group, but he does meet with one of um, the evangelicals that we meet with. But Yeah, and it's, it was incredible because we left that church. This, this trip was a whirlwind, one thing right after another, and it was, it was all good things. We left this church, and this is a guy that we didn't recognize. We're like, oh, he's probably part of the North Carolina group or something. And uh, he's just sitting in the back of our van. He's, like, walking up. He, like, loads in, and we're like, okay. Now we're just all sitting in this van getting to know everybody. And, and then the guy behind me starts talking to Cody. And, Cody. and he starts asking about his journey, his faith, what he's rooted in. You know, just because we want to hear people's testimonies because we're thinking, oh, we're all believers here. And then Cody starts saying some things. And I turn around, and then eventually it all hit us that this guy – goes to a fundamentalist LDS church. Like, this guy is LDS. So all of us, all eight of us in the back there who had spent months preparing for this trip and study, we just all turned around and just started blaring questions at him. And he was really gracious, and we were kind. But it, it was so funny. We just all saw him. We instantly started engaging him in, in content. And, and he, was, he loved it. He loved he's it. He's not about, like, getting out of the Mormon church, but he goes to his grandpa every time, and his grandpa is like, you can just stay and like but his mentor that's an evangel evangelical has met with his parents his parents are like a-okay with him leaving everything and cody even is like you know i wish my family would be evangelicals because you guys are just so nice and it's like mm -hmm. do you hear what you're saying yeah like, he he told us as we were talking with him he, i mean and he got to know us a little bit better he said he said man i know you you guys you guys love Jesus so much, I know you guys are getting celestial kingdom. <laughs> and, and so I was like, uh, thank you, I guess. Uh, um, which, for those that don't know, celestial kingdom is the highest level of heaven in the LDS view. And so we were like, thank you. Uh, yeah. But it was, it was really good to talk to him. Um, and he stayed with us. He kind of followed us. I mean, he enjoyed spending time with us. He followed us through the whole trip, and we got to share the gospel with him quite a bit. Um, oh, this is, this is one of my favorite uh, events here. So if you want the full thing of Ben talking to him, it is on my YouTube channel. <laughs> there's, um, there's this guy uh, who spent about 30-some years in the LDS church years ago. Um, name it right up there, Sean McCraney. He, he spent about 30 years in the LDS church. Then he spent about 10 or 15 years in an evangelical setting. And then he now is in a place where he seems to be captivated by the person of Christ, but he's rejected all organized religion. He has a, 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 almost like an animosity towards all, all organized religion. He, he despises it. And so um, he's a really interesting character. And so... What our guide did, our Ratio Christi guide who lives in Salt Lake and has organized all this for us, he took us there because this guy challenged us on a lot that we believed. Yeah, and typically if people leave the LDS church, they will throw the baby and the bathwater out and they'll swing all the way to like atheism because there's like, well, if this isn't true, then nothing's true. Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's the most common and you'll hear about that later. So we went into his studio. He's got a YouTube channel. And we got to participate, and the very first thing he does is he starts asking us very uncharitable questions. And when we want to, you know, at, it's like, uh, do you think all Catholics are going to hell? Do you think this, this person's going to hell? Do you think this, and we're just like, whoa, dude, there's a lot we need to talk about here. But he's saying, nope, it's just yes or no. So very uncharitable, but he, he, yeah, 
He's got a YouTube channel as well that, but in fact, with his YouTube channel, he was using this for a video. The conversation went along, and we were a little bit more knowledgeable than I think he was prepared for. He did for. flip us off with those fingers. <laughs> he, he, and multiple explicatives. Um, I think, to sum it up quickly, this guy is a case in point that when you don't have good, biblical, truthful Christian community, you will go in and you will fall for anything out there. Because there are a lot of lies that people can believe, but there's only one truth. And so um, this guy, I mean, uh, it was really good. I think the other thing was we had another group that was from Arkansas, a little bit related to us, and they, they came in, and they had never seen this kind of interaction before. For me, this was old hat. I'm used to talking to militant atheists on campus at K-State all the time. So I was in my element. I was having fun. But, but these guys, these guys were, they were shell-shocked. And then, and then as we started talking about some of these things and, and dissecting the conversation, they began to realize that he was saying a lot of false things. So yeah. very quickly. Yeah. So day Move two. On. Man, day one, big day, right? Yeah. Sorry, we'll, we'll get through this a little bit quicker. Yeah. So we went to the Utah Christian Research Center, and what it is, it is a bookstore, and sometimes if Mormons are, like, questioning what they believe, they go to this bookstore, and this guy is able to, like, guide them to the Bible and the truth of the Bible and, like, kind of then the Mormon theology, and they have plenty of resources to, like, um, give. Yeah, I thought this was a great tool. They have LDS come in, LDS who are on the fringe about to leave the faith come in. They also have believers who are in the area come in. And so a lot of people using those resources, Is there? go to the picture, and you can see the biblical archaeology. There's stuff they've pulled from the Holy Land. It's really cool to see. Um, and you can see on this picture on the right, just a little bit, there's this uh, gentleman, he's kind of leaning over. He's, he's actually trying to pick up a replica of the golden plates. And so you might have heard of, in, in the LDS tradition, there's golden plates. And it's just another cool, tangible example of how it doesn't really make much sense uh, uh, on the LDS view is, because these plates were so heavy, and we're, it, we were trying to lift them up. I say, they were what, 100, 100 pounds, yeah. 150 pounds? The LDS pounds? has had to like redact how much it's weighed to make it more like, oh, like an average man could carry these plates. Like, Half a mile. And the reason for that is because Joseph Smith was, was they was told in their, in their tradition that he carried those plates and ran like miles through yeah. like a like forest area and everything like and fought people off. He had them in his, under his arm. It's, yeah, so it's just really cool stuff they have at this research uh, center mm -hmm. that they can, um, they can give you a tangible view of some of the things that might challenge the LDS worldview. Okay. So then we went to Salt Lake, and we went to Temple Square, mm -hmm. and has anyone heard of Ancestry? Ancestry. Anyone yeah. heard of that? Ancestry. Fun fact, the Mormons own it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's another thing. One of the things to know about the, the LDS church is they are a $250 billion industry. They're one of the largest landowners in the entire world, and they, some, there's been sometimes they've had $50 billion just in extra cash they didn't know what to do with. And so you can see this immaculate uh, architecture, and they've really invested in, in some yeah. of these things. So this is the Church History Museum, and you go in there, and it's like a D.C. caliber museum. And, like, it's just so sad. They're putting so much money into this, like, false gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this is, of course, one of the things they have on Temple Square. They're right in Salt Lake City. Um, and on the top left there, we, we were walking through this museum, and one of the first stops you go is you go to this panoramic video that shows the experience of Joseph Smith. So when, when he got his revelation from God, he went out into this forest, and, and it was incredible because um, in the depiction, they showed like a dark force coming over him, and then he came to after... Um, he felt that dark presence, and then he was in the presence of both Christ and God the Father in well, human form. Well, there's a couple form. different visions. There's, like, different yeah. variations. That's, yeah, which is another problem in itself. But um, one of the impactful things about that is I don't know why you would want your prophet to have a dark spiritual encounter before he reveals his or gets the revelation from God. That seems a little bit problematic to me, but um, it's just incredible to see some of these narratives in the LDS tradition propagate through through, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we met this really sweet older woman, and she was doing the plates there, and she was, like, just talking about her life and everything, and she's like, yeah, 
you know, grace cover us 99.9%, but we just have to do our 0.1%. And it's heartbreaking because she's like maybe late yeah. 70s, she's an older lady. 80s, yeah. and she's like, yeah, you just got to do that extra 0.1% to work. And then Ben's a rebel, almost got kicked out of the Temple <laughs> nah, Square. Not nah, get kicked off. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, first, this is Temple Square. So um, right in the dead center, you can see a bunch of scaffolding around their temple. So a few years ago, they had an earthquake, and on the top of every temple, they have a golden statue Moroni. of Moroni. And an earthquake hit the temple there in Salt Lake, and the trumpet fell off. And so, um, talk about spiritual warfare. And... <laughs> You can, you can see that they've, they've actually, what they've done, it's actually pretty incredible. They've picked up the temple, literally raised the temple, and they're earthquake-proofing it. Um, and they're also spending millions of dollars. Down there's a little square there. They're spending millions of dollars running a tunnel from the temple down underneath the road over to where we're standing on top of, which is the conference center, big, where they have tens of thousands of LDS come in for general conference. And the reason they're building that, that tunnel underneath is... One of the reasons is so the leadership can go from general conference to the temple without going, you know, walking across. And you say, why do that? It's because during general conference, every six months, there are so many evangelicals preaching the gospel in between general conference and the temple. And they don't want to dialogue with any of them, which is, man, can you talk about a red flag? Um, but, but that's something that's pretty incredible. And uh, on the far right, you'll see a silver dome. That's the, that's the tabernacle. That's where the Mormon tabernacle choir. I that's, bet they changed their name because they're trying to disassociate Also with true. Mormons. Yeah. And so, so um, going back to Maryland, so we were, we were with Maryland up, and that was back in the uh, church museum. Yeah. And I was there, and I was talking with her, with a, a group of people. And uh, we were just talking about her life and hearing her journey, and turns out her her husband had Parkinson's, and uh, there's some other people in her family that were needing surgery. So we just said, can we pray for you about that? Can we, like, pray, you know, that for your family? And, and so we, we prayed, and she said, okay, but make it quick. She was reluctant. She said, make it quick. And we're like, okay. And this security guard is, like, getting closer and closer and closer. I'm like, we I need look, to, like, speed this up, or we're going to all get, like, I look out. out of the corner of my eye, and I see this man suited up, coil, everything. And he's just, he's, he's leaning in. I'm like, What's, what's he about? So we prayed with her, and then we, me and this other guy, we walked, we walked all the way to those tall buildings in the far back, um, and then out and around. We just walked all over. We went to the conference center, and then we came back to the uh, tabernacle, and we went in there, and we started talking with a couple sister missionaries. And as we were, we were talking to them, we, we struck up conversation and um, where they were from, and, and then eventually I said, what have, what have your past experiences been? with evangelicals to these two sister missionaries who were stationed there in to help visitors. And right when I said that, she grimaced, and I was like, oh, man, not good, huh? She said, they've bashed us with the Bible quite a bit. And I, and I, and I told her right then and there, I said, I'm sorry. That's, I mean, nobody should treat you that way. Nobody should have that, tor- that, that sort of approach. Um, they should treat you with gentleness and respect, right? And... And so um, she's like, yeah, I, I appreciate that. But you guys, you guys are. And right when she, when she said that, I looked over, and there comes in that man with a coil in the earpiece again. And, man, he, I, I look at him, and I'm like, he's walking fast. This man's on a mission. <laughs> and so it was me and my buddy there and another guy, and we're talking with him just casually. And he comes in there, and he puts his phone up on his chest, and he walks up, and he puts it in each one of our faces, gets our faces, and he says, you guys are not allowed to proselytize on Temple Square. This is our property, and we will remove you if we need to. You guys are not allowed to share any of your views. On, and we're like, we, we didn't mean to, and said, no, no, I'm not going to discuss this with you. This is not up for negotiation. Am I understood? And, and we're like, we didn't mean to offend anybody. He's like, I'm done talking about this. And, you know, he said, we will remove you if we have to. So he walked off. A couple security guards went and watched us. And these girls' eyes, these two, you know, you know what, 18, 19-year-old girls, their eyes just, you know, blew open. And I was like, we didn't mean to offend anybody. And we were talking with them after he left. And we're like, we're sorry. And it's like, they're like, no, we get this a lot. And I'm like, oh, really? And, and it just goes to show, can you talk about a red flag? where we can't 
pray. And we, we told the, the, the gals there, we said, all we did was pray with a lady whose husband had Parkinson's. That's all we did. And it was incredible. Just can you, can you say that there is a red flag there, that they suppress that type of dialogue? Um, and so that was an incredible, and we, we were, so we weren't kicked off, but, but, um, but it, was, it was more of a kick down. That happens quite a bit um, over in Utah. Um, it's, they're, they're trying to censor um, those conversations as much as they can. And, and I think, honestly, if they keep doing that, it's only going to hurt their witness because truth will not be confined and censored like that. Truth always wins. So. And then every yeah. once in a while we could plug in some fun things. So we went to High School Musical, and then this is Joseph Smith on a Sphinx. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is. And they do sell them. I think he said somewhere. So if you want one of them, let me know. <laughs> that I is Joseph Smith's a cast of Joseph Smith's face put on a sphinx. And yeah. it was it was pretty cool. Um, we went to East High because this was on her bucket list. You're being you're being awfully nice. Yeah. <laughs> she this she was she was really wanting to do this. So we show up there at like 5:30 and we're late. We got to keep going. But we get there and there's a guy there who's filming and he's like, oh yeah, one of the cast from that show. Yeah. He's is like, gonna Coach come. Bolton's going to be here at 6 o'clock. Like my watch. You should have seen like her face. She 5.58, is. and I was <laughs> like, I was like, okay, I want to stay, but like we're really late to this next thing. And they're yeah. like, mm, we have a couple minutes, so we got to stay in. Got to see him. Coach actually, Bolton is confirmed to be Mormon, I believe. Yeah, or he is also LDS. LDS. Um, yeah, yeah, moving on. So this is the Savolkas. So this guy... I don't know his name, but he is the dad of this other guy. And he goes to Costco, he buys a hot dog, and then he evangelizes. So he'll be like, hey, can I sit by you? And they're like, yeah, sure. And they'll be like, hey, have you heard of this verse? And they're like, oh, like, yeah. And then he like, starts talking to them, and they call him the hot, like the Costco evangelist. <laughs> and then this is his son. And as you can see, it says mormoninfo.com or Joseph Lied. He has so many stories. He'll go to like some of the ta- uh, temple openings. And have his sign with lights on it and just to try to like say Joseph lied. And he's gotten so many emails like, hey, I saw you at this temple opening and I wrote it down in my notes. And then when my shelf came crumbling down 10 years later, that was in my notes. And I was able to go and just research everything you had on the website. So it was cool to see. Yeah, so that's been kind of a mantra is, you know, challenging these LDS with love and respect and with truth to where we give them truth, and they, maybe they put it on the shelf. They don't want to deal with something that we said. They put it on their shelf, and, and someday, you know, that shelf might come down, and, and uh, they're going to have to deal with some of these things, some of these challenges we have for their worldview and some other things like that. And so that's been kind of a mantra for us. It's incredible. Like, you know, the ministry, by the way, the people that are between General Conference and the temple, and they, they built a tunnel, that thing, he's one of those guys. And it's incredible how much the Internet has has ruined the LDS church's ability to hold on to its members because now people can go get information and see these challenging views to their worldview. Yeah, and so this, yeah. we, we also went, so we got the full full experience. Yeah. We went and talked to a BYU scholar on campus, but first we did, uh, we walked around campus and we had conversations. So we just walked around campus by twos and met with people, and you have to be careful not to, Mention that you're and they have a dress code at BYU, and so we had some guy that had like full beards, and they're probably like, "You definitely do not belong on campus." <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you have to be careful around that because um, you know if they know that you're proselytizing, they'll they'll kick you off BYU campus. Our our guide got kicked off, and so but we were fortunate enough to have some great conversations that'll come up later. And then we talked to this guy, um, a professor at BYU. He's he's like. He's a huge academic yeah, in Egyptology like, and Old Testament. Yeah, and his, like, great-great-grandfather has a building named after him on campus. Like, oh, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm related to the guy that has the building. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, we, we actually were able to challenge him a little bit, too, because, I mean, even some things about the LDS uh, faith is, you know, we asked him, like, where are the Nephite artifacts? And he's like, you know what? That's a tough one. And there's a lot of context there, but but they're, they're, they haven't found any. So, um Skipping on that backstory, but 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 the idea there is is even even him he he had to say you know what I hope someday we'll find some, and it's just there's there's a lot of things he takes on faith as he's well. He's so smart academically, but he can't go from his academic brain to like switch it to his religious religious brain. Mm-hmm. But also, so 
there's a lot of Joseph Smiths. And so there's two Joseph Smith oh, yeah. buildings. There's a Joseph F. Smith building and the Joseph Smith building. And some of our crew were trying to go to the building to meet him. And, like, everyone at BYU is so nice. And so we had two, they had a group, and they're like, oh, like, can you help us? He's like, oh, yeah, I'll take you with you. And it was, his name was Timothy. And, like, we just evangelize all the time. And so one of our crew, he was asking him questions, and he seemed more interested. And Dustin was like, hey, like, I have to go to this, but, like, here's my number. Like, you can do it. And just Dustin sits down, and the guy's like, no, like, come, come, come back. He interrupts the professor, yeah. jumps into the yeah. classroom, and says, hey, hey, I forgot to – and so Dustin goes out. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, and they go to the stairwell, and Dustin's able just to preach the gospel. They're both in tears, mm-hmm. and he's like, if we need to, we can take you back to Omaha with us. <laughs> and he is currently, the, Timothy is currently meeting with Dustin every Wednesday going through the book of Galatians. Mm-hmm. So that was a really cool yeah. thing that happened. Incredible. Like, in props. It was, it's so cool that Dustin got that opportunity because he just, he sat in the stairwell and they shared life together and Timothy had so many questions, but you know, Dustin seemed to have a lot of answers. And so it was cool to see that dialogue between them. Excellent moment from them. Uh, and really quickly, do you have anything on this? No, this is the Phelps. They um, were LDS and it took them 40 years to hear the true gospel. And now I believe they're relocating to somewhere down south where more LDS live. They're going to start a church. And then this is some Chinese Sundays. If you think it's ironic, read 3 Nephi 2.15. You'll know why it's kind of ironic. And then we had one of our first worship services with our team. And it was a really sweet time. Yeah. It's just incredible. It goes to show that these people can, can go their whole lives and never even meet somebody who can articulate the gospel. So it's just, it's so unreached over there. It really is. Cool. This is, uh, go ahead. Do you want so anything on this? It's in Sol- this is Solid Rock Cafe. It's in Ephraim, Utah. It is, so if you know, LDS, they do not drink coffee. And so this is a coffee shop they started. It is right across from Snow College. And you're like, why would I start a coffee shop next to a Mormon school? And it's because those that are kind of like, mm, maybe I should like dip my toe into something else, they will come to the coffee shop and just kind of like mm-hmm. be a little rebel. Yeah, the people who are on the fringe of the LDS faith, those people might drink coffee. And so it's, a, it's an excellent way to expand your outreach. They, they uh, actually, they, it's so full, they need to expand. Yeah. But they also have biblical archaeology exhibits in there so that these LDS people come in, they drink coffee, they got nice stuff from the Holy Land there, and they start taking an interest. And, and like, seeing. everything is, like, little nuggets. Like, th- their passcode is literally, it is finished. Yeah. So, like, it's cool to see all the things they've added just to kind of, like, mm-hmm. sneak things And in this there. this all started in Ephraim. So this is about two hours south of Salt Lake. Um, it all started because a couple, they were thinking about going overseas to an unreached people group, and they, they went on a trip to Utah, and on their way back, a, pa- a pastor caught them, and he said, hey, you guys, if you want to do mis- mission work, you could just stay here in Utah. And he said, yeah, we, we're, but we're really thinking about going out, out east and, you know, international. He's like, okay, just do one thing for me. On your way back to Arizona, count how many biblical churches, and you can tell architecturally which ones are different. Go count them. Count them on your way back. That was a really tricky question. He didn't see because any. he saw zero. And so then they, they moved to Ephraim, started a church, and now they're doing outreach to the college campus there with the Ratio Christi. And yeah, it's really taken off for them. It's good stuff. So this is uh, the people that started the coffee shop has, has Tri Grace Ministries, which I have it linked on here. But here is um, the LDS Law of Eternal Life. It's mm-hmm. also out on the board mm-hmm. if you want to see Yeah, there's it. a handout. Yeah. But and go back is- to that real quick, if you wouldn't mind. You can see that staircase. And those are all the things you have to do to make celestial kingdom. And if you don't, well, maybe you'll settle for terrestrial or telestial, or maybe there's another way that you can get, get around that. But there are a lot of things involved. And so if you, go, if you switch that, now you notice on this view, there is no staircase. There is no elevating yourself up to earn that eternal life status. And there's also no levels or differentiation here. This is just simply, oh, by the way, it's a free gift of God. And you could experience all of those things on the bottom there. But everybody gets eternal life through the gospel. And so it's a really great infographic there just to help you conceptualize. Okay, so before this next slide, just let you know, there's there's LDS and FLDS. The FLDS are the ones that are polygamists. But there's also a difference between... FLDS and polygamists. Because mm-hmm. if you call 
a polygamist and FDLS, they will not be very happy. Yeah, they, and so there's, yeah, if you want to slide back to that. Um, yeah, the F stands for fundamentalist. And these are, they, we, we say F LDS because they kind of adhere more to the original teachings of Joseph Smith, the original stuff. Which is, it's more fun to talk to them because they will actually like believe what they believe. They will actually like, oh, know their stuff and believe okay, it so in we that can sense. Because yeah. like the LDS, they're like, oh, we don't, we don't believe that anymore. But the F LDS are like, we do still believe that. Yeah, and so um, and there's a couple branches off of on the polygamous thing, but this just goes to show you that just like any other organization, there's a lot of splinter groups that really disagree with one another. And so um, terminology is, is a pretty big hurdle. Do you have, oh, well, so th another thing, like we got the full experience, we went um, to go to a polygamist uh, Shavuot dinner, but basically it's just a, a supper where they, we went into their house, it was like a house church, and they, there was some preaching and a lot of questions, basically mostly Q&A. We were asking them. They were very gracious and kind, and they fed us, and, um, and we got to talk to them. We stayed there till like 11 or, or, or so. It was late. Yeah, <laughs> but, and so there was actually one person there, and he was practicing polygamy, and so I got to talk to them. Well, I get there. We're eating, and there's this girl with a child. I'm like, oh, this is probably just one of his wives and we start talking and it's one of his daughters <laughs> but like we've been texting back and forth the past couple months so that's been fun yeah but i got to talk to um her dad and just learn some more about pokemon if you have questions let me know because i can tell you about oh yeah we can that goodness. going on day does five. anyone notice <laughs> <laughs> so this is there's a little video playing in the bottom left this was later in the on that thursday we had like an outreach just for the community um, just, you know, singing, um, you know, playing some games, doing some stuff. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun activities we had. But we went door knocking? Yes, before this, we went and we did outreach. So we went door knocking. We just met with people on the street and just talked to them and just, hey, we're visiting. We're evangelicals. We're here to have conversations. Very casual. And so, um, <laughs> oh, so many things to share. Uh, the couple on the right, I met him at BYU. I sat down and ate lunch with him and talked to him, and I'm still communicating with him now. Um, he's really interested in scripture, and so we had an excellent time. Oh, we, we, we talked to them yeah. for about four they or were, five hours. They were the first ones that showed up, and like I was playing volleyball at the time, and I was like, oh, I want to play volleyball, but this is way more important. And I, as we were like talking, we kept talking and talking, and like I want a picture of us with them. So I asked this one guy, hey, like take a picture of us. And, like, you can see his, like, from the beginning to the end, it's, like, it is light outside, and there's tons of people. And then by the end, it's, like, completely dark, and there's, like, three people left. And, like, even by the end, we were talking, and Wesley, he's our leader, he was, like, can they take you home? And they're, like, yeah, sure. And so they gave us a ride back to our Airbnb. Yeah. And so one of the, one of the cool things about door knocking, there's some cool experiences we had. Real briefly, um, I'll try and share maybe just one or two. But... Um, as I was walking through, we were just walking through um, uh, down there. It was, it was in Provo, I think. And I saw this guy cutting down a tree. And um, I just went over there, watched it, watched him. And he, was, he just got done. And he, and he saw us just kind of looking at the landscaping he was doing. And so I, we were just, me and another guy, we were just standing there watching. And, and he came over and he went right up to us, like, hey, like, what are you guys doing? Uh, wh I mean, what are you up to? And we said, oh, we're just, you know, looking at what you, looks like you got a lot of work ahead of you. He's like, yeah, yeah. So we just started talking. And, and then, you know, as the conversation kind of winded down, he started to walk back a little bit. Really nice guy. And I said, yeah, actually, I didn't want him to go. I was like, yeah, uh, actually, we're evangelicals. And we're here to have conversations. And he stopped dead in his tracks. And he turned around. And he walked right up to me. And he said, he said, man, I cannot tell you, my, like, how tragic my story in the LDS church has been. And so he just, he just poured out his heart in that moment, and he was, he talked about how, oh man, it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking, because he was talking about how he w went on his mission, and he was the best of the best, you know, but he just felt this burden of perfectionism and performance in the LDS church, and um, it just, it really put such a burden on him that he was going to take his own life, and so he had everything ready, he was about to do it, and his buddy called him, and say, and the Lord really saved him from that, from that moment. And, and so he said one thing that night had to go, either my faith or my life. And it just, it just goes to show like how much of a burden that that workspace salvation can push someone to. And, and really, he was, one of the, he was probably one of the nicest people I met that whole 
week. And he said, yeah, I'd love to like host you guys, my family. And I, he's an atheist now. But I'd love to host you for dinner. And like, I just say, you know, man, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. Like that. He's like, you know, I can't believe in a God that would have those standards. And I said, you know what? I don't believe in that God either. And it was incredible to see how much healing that conversation brought. We had to do so much work to bring these people out of the pain that the LDS system just inherently brings in order to even get to a place where we could talk about the gospel. There's just a lot of work that has to be done in, in this area. And uh, another example, man, so many examples um, of conversations we had. Talked to one gal and knocked on her door, and she left the faith, and um, she's now gone to New Age spirituality. She actually, because of the perfection and performance base, she went into like a drug abuse, abusive situation, and and she was just so grateful to talk to us because we were, we were just empathizing with her story and talked to another guy who had been in the church until he was 35, and it was, he, that's, I mean, he literally left the church a year before um, we, we had that conversation with him, and he said, yeah, I see the corruption in the, in the LDS church, and I see them hitching their wagon to the back of evangelical Protestantism, because he's noticing that the church is moving away from Mormonism. It used to be in the 90s, Mormons would tell you, our church is right, and you're wrong. Nowadays, the LDS church rebrand, it's, it's, it, what it's saying is, oh, um, we, we're, we're Christians too. We believe too. the same thing we you believe. We believe the same Jesus. Yeah, we're, basic, we're just brothers and sisters. But when you really say, what do you mean by Jesus? You really start to see the differences. So excellent testimonies. Yeah, I could talk all day about the conversations we had. but Yeah, so this day we got to hear from two ex-polygamists. And their stories is so heartbreaking because in polygamy, it just breeds so much sin and everything. And it's like this, the woman, she grew up in polygamy. And she's like, nope, I'm not going to do this. I can't. And so she tried to get out. But then they get out and they're like, well, like, now what do I do? And, like, she went going back, and she ended up being, like, a fourth wife to a person. And then Grover. Yeah, oh, let, me, let me stay on her for just a little bit. It's, her story is, is one of the most heartbreaking. Yeah. She's, she's just recently got out, and she's in her 50s. I think she's, like, four or five years since she's gone yeah, out. Yeah, and she's in her 50s. And the abuse that she experienced started when she was just out of diapers. Yeah, and she was, like, six. And Six, I think. under this under this view, the I mean, polygamy breeds crime, and so um, she she tried to leave this this system, but she had nothing. She leave for a year, and the, the, of abuse and you know these these kind of cult like branches of LDS, but then she she just had nothing, no alternative, nothing to go to. No one was able to preach the gospel to her, um, and she did that four or five times. She left, had to come back. For her whole life, and um, and eventually she heard the gospel on the radio, and then she got out. There's ministry that people are doing to reach those people. Those and I women believe I have a the, booklet the, out there that yeah. she read. Yeah, or, yeah, there's a booklet. Yeah. So, so and Grover. This is Grover. So Grover was married to two wives. They ended up both leaving him, and he has found the Lord. But his family, like his son's daughter, are still in polygamy, mm -hmm. and his daughter is like, Dad, you're not going to preach at my kids. He's like, okay. But he's like, if they ask me a question, I want to give them the answer. And all around his house, he has all these, like, signs just, like, sprinkled out. So, like, a verses, verses yeah. just sprinkled out so, like, they can see it. And when one time, his granddaughter was over, and she was like, Mom, I don't get it. Grandpa Grover is the nicest person ever. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you that, like, there's not a lot of things going on mm -hmm. in the yeah, there's not, a, there's not a lot of good fruit sometimes because mm -hmm. these people are not in the true root, right, and of, of the gospel. And it's just incredible how it ripples through the generations, all of this hurt. I mean, because when these kids experience all this trauma, it just carries into their adult life and it happens to their kids. This, it's a very cyclical thing. Um, and then we had another In-N-Out Burger fun trip and... Uh, <laughs> And we had a debrief there on the right, and it was just incredible to see everybody's stories uh, in the group and all the things that had happened. It was, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we're heading home. We've been evangelizing all week, and, like, we just do it all the time. And so we went to Arby's for lunch, and this guy had a cross necklace on. And so there's, like, 
12 of us. So each one of us is like asking a question, ordering, okay? Next person asks a question and order. And like there's a line. And this guy gets one, he's like, are you going to order? Like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to order. <laughs> yeah, so it was just, we all come off this high of evangelizing, door knocking, and then, and then yeah, this guy, I mean, the line starts backing up, and we're just holding up the line and having conversation with this guy, and he's starting to sweat because they got to get work done. And um, It was just a really good, really good, wholesome moment. Um, yeah, and then we called the sisters missionaries on the way home. Yeah. We got to talk to them. So we've bit. stayed in contact with quite a few people and given the contacts to the local churches there so they can reach out to some of these people with broken stories. And so, then, well, that's all we have. Yeah. Uh, Any uh, questions? Yeah. And it looks like we're pretty short on time. Um, <laughs> if there are any questions, please stop us. Come ask us. Um, second bell is going to ring here pretty soon. Um, but, yeah, just let us know if you have any questions about anything. We'd love to hear from you. Um, there's a lot of good stuff there. So, yeah. We'll have uh, a few minutes. If anybody has a question, we would have time for one or two. So where do we start learning about LDS cool. and the differences and um, like either books or places? Where do we even start? Because it's so vast. Okay, so I do have my trifold out there with a lot of resources. But if you go to try grace ministry they have a lot of free resources on there to um do that i have yeah there's a lot of books out there um if you want aaron marshall to come speak that would be fine or even wesley but also yeah she uh yeah it was funny she's got a lot of books out there and as she's collected all of it in her study original scripts that translations from joseph smith this all this stuff and as we were meeting with that couple uh that Mormon couple, we were talking with them, and she's pulling out all her books, and they're like, I don't even have one of those, you know, and so, it's, yeah, there's, to, to your point, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can learn, and um, really just getting interested in, in starting there would be a good place at Try Grace. Anyone else? Okay, so fun fact, I learned that they would not admit Utah as a state until they got rid of polygamy. So they like, got rid of it, but they like call it what lying for the government is okay. So it's like basically sometimes they get like a speeding ticket for being married. But legally they're only married to one person. Yeah, and yeah, so there's there's a lot of backstory and history that you can get into on that, on the, the polygamy thing, but but yeah, it a lot of splinter groups have, have still practiced that today um, because, and that's the tragic part, is where did it come from? It came from the original teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young because what happens in these polygamists with all the brokenness, you know, all this, all this abuse, where it starts is the men often read the scripture and they find, I have to have three wives to enter the celestial kingdom. And then they, it, the light bulb goes off and then that just leads them into a life uh, Full of crime because that's yeah, and they don't necessarily get to pick their wives. Like the prophet gets like prophecies, like oh, Joe's gonna marry Sue, and it's like oh, oh, Joe's also gonna marry like Debbie over here. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of picking and choosing. Yeah, so it's still practiced in very, very small splinter groups. So thankfully, Ben and Hannah aren't going too far. So if you have more questions, uh, catch them after the service. So. And Carly and I had an opportunity to go out a couple of years ago as well, so I also have resources in my office and, and some extra We only things. need 20 people to go to Utah, so if you guys want to plan a trip, we can go to Utah. 16. Four, one, two, oh, yeah, 16. 16. Yeah. Uh, join me as we just pray for Ben and Hannah. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for Ben and Hannah's opportunity to travel to Utah uh, and interact with people from the LDS. Uh, we're thankful for the seeds, not only the seeds that you helped them plant while they were there, uh, but also opportunities to come back and continue to be in conversations through text and email uh, and have phone calls with folks that still have questions. So thank you for their faithfulness. Uh, we're thankful that we can partner with them in both finances and prayer. And we just continue to pray for them as they get ready to transition back to campus, that they would take this experience with them, 
that they could learn from it and grow from it and just continue to share on campus with students and faculty alike uh, the truth of who you are and what it really takes to get to heaven. So we're thankful again for this time, and we'll give it back to you in Jesus' name. Amen.